Welcome, everybody. Thanks for, for joining our panel on uh, GPLP relations. Um, I'm, I want to start by introducing my uh, dear friends and business partners, and most importantly for today's purposes, our esteemed panelists. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves and their, their companies. Uh, Lindsay McMurray, could we start with you, please? Morning, afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindsay McMurray, a managing partner of Pollen Street Capital. Uh, we are a, a, an independent um, investment manager focused on the financial services sector, and we do that cross capital structure. So what we look to do is play into the overall mega trends in financial services, which are changing demographics, customer uh, requirements and needs the huge drive to technology and the desire for positive impact. And we play those mega, mega trends across different strategies. So we have both a private uh, a, a credit strategy and a growth private equity strategy, but looking at domain knowledge to, to across different cap parts of the capital structure. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Mark, Mark Johnson. Hi, I'm Mark Johnson, managing partner of Astra Capital. We are a communications and technology services growth buyout firm based in Washington, D.C. We focus mostly on uh, private equity investing through the LBO structure, but also will execute transactions and, and other structural um, mechanisms where, where we see fit. Our partners range from the operational side of the communications and technology sector to investing in regulation. And we try to take our, our wealth of history in the space to identify assets that we think are ripe for accelerated growth, given many of the exciting trends we see in communications and tech. So thank you for, for having me, Daniel. Thanks, Mark. And Shirag. Shirag good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Greetings from Alaska. Thanks, Daniel and Wathra, Capital Constellation for moderating this panel. Uh, I'm Chirag Shah, I'm a Senior Portfolio Manager at the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation, a $80 billion sovereign endowment that was formed in 1976 to manage capital on behalf of all Alaskans. Uh, Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation has a $15 billion private equity and special opportunities portfolio led by Alternatives head Steve Mosley. We have about 20 to 25% of our exposure in directs and co-investments and exposure across venture growth and buyouts. About 75% of the portfolio is US focused today. We have a pretty flexible mandate and think we've been pretty creative in the marketplace collaborating with groups such as Capital, Constellation, and Wafra. Thanks so much, Shirag. And as far as myself, Daniel Adamson, I'm uh, the president of, of the aforementioned Capital Constellation, which we'll be speaking a bit about. And I'm also a senior managing director at Wafra. Wafra is a $28 billion uh, alternatives focused investment advisor in New York. And Constellation is a joint venture between Alaska Permanent, British Railway Pension System, uh, the Public Institution for Social Security of Kuwait, um, and a number of other leading asset owners around the world, like AP3 in Sweden um, and KIA in Kuwait. And it's been our privilege over the last four years to partner with uh, 14 of the most promising next generation alternative investment advisors in the world, including Mark and Lindsay. Um, and so what you have here today in, in this panel is there's a group of four uh, institutions and four individuals who are actually working together in the sense that we're aligned to each other's successes and, and, um, and very busy when we're not doing panels like this one, sharing ideas and, uh, and deals. So the topic for today's panel, uh, reimagining GPLP relationships, but I think more broadly, we'll be touching on some themes around innovation and private markets. And in speaking with Lindsay and Mark and Chirag before this discussion, there were a, a few themes that we, we all wanted to touch on um, under the banner of innovation and, and in particular, how to take the innovation budget that so many of us have earned in the last several years through, through strong performance uh, and translate that political capital that we have, the actual capital that we have, the, the goodwill from our employees, the support of our partners, um, our governance mandates. How do we translate that budget for innovation into meaningful innovation that delivers value to our stakeholders? And in particular, I know we're going to talk about four general themes. One is innovation around structure. So 
Um, how do we change the way that we partner? Constellation is an example of, of one such change, but there are so many going on in the market um, from the nature of the vehicles, the duration of the vehicles, um, building consortia among asset owners and asset managers, um, warehousing of co-investments, you name it, we'll talk about it. Um, the second theme is, is pursuing new markets and sectors. Um, that could also be, uh, you know, as Lindsay will discuss, the journey to, to uh, uh, serving clients across investments across the capital stack. Um, the third theme is, is team. So here we are in the post-COVID or mid-COVID era with an eye to the post-COVID era, trying to, to take some of the benefits of, of, of global collaboration through uh, virtual events like this um, and bring them home to our own teams and our own business models. And so I think we've actually seen a flourishing of new ways of doing business, which is a theme that we'll be talking about today. Um, and, and last but not least is technology. And, and since we benefit from Lindsay's um, expertise in FinTech and, and Mark's expertise across um, the technology ecosystem, I know they'll both have a lot to say as well, Shirag, given Alaska's history as a leading technology investor um, on how each of you can think about technology as it relates to your innovation budget. Um, so with that, um, without further ado, I wanted to, to kick things over with the first question to, to, to Lindsay. Um, Lindsay, your transformation during the COVID era has been equally dramatic and successful. Uh, it's, been a, it's been Constellation's privilege to be a small part of, of your journey as you have reimagined uh, Pollen Street. Um, how do you work with your clients differently now than you did pre-COVID? Well, I, I, the way I see, um, just kind of taking a step back for a second and where I see COVID, I think what we're generally doing and believe we're doing is we, we are focused in the financial services sector and we believe, as I mentioned in my introduction, that there are a number of mega trends that go across that sector. Those are structural changes that are taking place in the marketplace and those are in some ways, generational changes that we are we're playing into, which is why we believe we can continue to find growth, in, you know, in this um, in this, this this environment. But but beyond that, so then we're saying, you know, do we have the reason um, to to be relevant to the sector? When we've had a crisis, each crisis, and in some ways, our, our our positioning and our strategy came from the last crisis, the 078 crisis. Each time you have a crisis, there's a the, the same th the structural changes there, but they get accelerated. There's a greater catalyst for change. There's a greater acceptance of change. We're all talking about, we're all on this call. Um, we're doing things virtually. Things that were kind of seen as sacred cows have, started, have been swept away. So I think we're not particularly behaving differently. We're playing into the same structural thematics, but COVID does accelerate or a crisis does accelerate the, the, the nature of change and the acceptance of change. And I think, you know, the way we're looking at um, our capability, what we're doing is taking our capability across those mega trends of saying customer, you know, there's a huge um, digital transformation play. There's a new, huge, um, customer engagement um, and desire for higher and better products and financial services. There's a demographic change. There's a desire for positive impact change. And those big thematics, we're playing into different strategies and to different vehicles in some ways. So we've got a senior credit fund. We've got a growth private equity fund. We have private sources of capital and LPGP structure. We have co-invest vehicles and we also have public vehicles. In some ways, the, the innovation of why you should be um, fixed to one set of um, one set of structures of capital that's been kind of thrown open, um, and we we believe that we can play into using the the, the the domain expertise. We can then apply that to fit risk appetite of different customers, different clients in different markets. So that's how we are seeing the overall environment kind of change and adopt to accept, you know, you don't need to sit in your own cottage industry. You can actually build a firm with different, with a, with a core capability serving different client base with different risk appetite and different demands. We have income funds, we have capital generation funds. So all of that can play. And I think there's a greater acceptance that that is a professionalization of the industry and not a distraction. 
I love the point that you've made in, in earlier conversations that we've had that in, in private equity in particular, we're so good or we're meant to be so good at, at um, delivering uh, value and creating change at our portfolio companies that often we ourselves as the, 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 the managing partners or CEOs of private equity firms neglect to innovate our own businesses and apply the same scrutiny. What I think the phrase is the cobbler's children go barefoot. Um, but you've done you've done exactly that. You've applied the the kind of um, uh, intensive operational change and transformation to Pollen Street itself. It must have been a challenge to be able to to serve all parts of the capital structure and to do it in both public and private vehicles. Yeah, and so I, I won't dominate the conversation. I'll allow my other panelists to speak. But I think that, you know when I say there's been a threshold moment in the last um, while, when, while we see a lot of the alternative managers and the excitement of the you know public listing of alternative managers, I think when I as a financial services investor professional look at the alternatives industry it is all the elements of structural growth the exciting kind of investment um, thesis that we seek in any event in our daily um, but there have been these this sort of um, in a bit uh, lack of acceptance of almost kind of professionalizing we talk in our daily lives some founders want growth capital some founders want to do succession planning that's all kind of prevalent in all of our daily lives and in private equity yet up until recently that has not been an acceptable way to professionalize our own industry so you know we don't think every mid-market company and industrials should remain founded owned 100% and not bringing growth capital, yet that has been till now, till very recently, that sort of um, very strong view. And I think that's just, you know, opened up and therefore it's opened up all sorts of possibilities of professionalizing and maturing ourselves in an industry. And while it's existed for decades, it's only now that we're applying the same technology to ourselves that has for decades been applied to every other industry. So I think it's kind of a, a, an interesting dynamic. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And, and Mark, um, as Lindsay was describing some of the thematic changes driving um, an industry that you both uh, look at in, through different lenses, but digital infrastructure. You know, I was meditating before this call on just how confusing that space can be to lay people such as myself, right? I mean, digital infrastructure is almost by definition hard for the average person to visualize. So as, as, as you've built out Astra and, and made such incredible strides since I think it was 2014 that you launched, um, uh, how, what, what do LPs need to understand about digital infrastructure in order to be the best partner for you? The one dynamic that has changed, I, I thought about as, as, as Lindsay spoke, if you think back to when we first were getting to know, know one another in 2015, 2016, the big question around the Astro Funds was, how, how can a partner in Austin, Texas, a partner in San Diego, and a partner in, in uh, Naples, Florida, all collectively you know, run a fund together and do business together? I, I think the last two years, have shown us that the, the limits of time and space um, don't stand in the way of working together collectively and collaborating effectively. And what we've been able to do in the last two years is really leverage the awakening the world has had to our industry. So at the asset owner level, to get back to your question around digital infrastructure, you've seen billions of dollars move into vehicles that now define themselves as infrastructure funds and, and include telecommunic many telecommunication assets in the same category as what used to be an airport, maybe uh, an oil and gas facility or something that was more quote unquote traditional infrastructure. And that's led to a bit of a bifurcation of what used to be called the TMT or just telecom media market in which there are now slithers of capital that focus on sort of mid-tier returns, call it you know, 10 to 20% target returns. And there's still a world of those who seek extraordinary returns, more private equity, uh, 25 plus type of returns that you get from perhaps an LBO product. And I think that's really allowed our industry to become even more interesting. Yeah, a sector that's been around 
you know, since since Alexander Graham Bell or before, can now be attacked from different angles. And folks like Lindsay, who have different uh, parts of the capital structure they seek to play, can tap into our space. But also the expertise that a team like ours, which brings a former FCC chairman, a former head of a company like Altel, a former middle market uh, manager of private equity backed assets, and a former Ericsson executive, all together to identify key trends in the sector um, can apply that talent in, in different ways in different places. So I think that the proliferation of new slithers of capital within the, the segment has really been useful for us as Astra has evolved. There's, there's new buyers for the businesses that, that we work with. There's new sellers of assets that we may wanna buy. And what never gets old is knowing how to attract great managers, identify key trends, and then build the right team around them. And a lot of what we've been able to do in the last couple of years with the advent of a much more kind of digitally focused economy is accelerate the learnings that happen at our management teams through collaboration events like these. And also, frankly, meet with investors who now have a much greater appreciation for what we do and, why, and, and how we do it because all of us now have had to say, well, what, what Wi-Fi do I have inside my building? And uh, you know, when is that 5G rollout really going to happen? Because, you know, I've got to do a, a parent-teacher conference over Zoom when previously people weren't as attuned to it. So I, I think in many ways our industry has come into people's homes in a way that has allowed many more investors to appreciate what we do and understand the need for specialists in the, in the segment. I, I love that vision of combining the human and the, the technological as it relates to our industry. You know, you're still driving the car, but you have the GPS and the, the human element is still important. But, you know, why shouldn't we be helping investors, uh, A, to work together in, in, in new ways based on new technology, but to decide whether to turn left or to turn right uh, at a particular deal opportunity um, using technology? And maybe we'll come, come back to some of those themes later in our panel. Um, Shirag. Um, uh, good to see you. And, and I, I'm going to take this moment to brag a, a, for a bit about Alaska because it's easier for me to do that, given my pride in our partnership than it is for you as a, as a senior leader at Alaska. But Alaska has been LP of the year in North America three of the last five years. Uh, you guys set out to build a directs program in, in private markets. I believe it was about seven years ago, which has just been hugely successful. Uh, it's a matter of public record that your net performance on your directs program is north of 53%, if memory serves, on a net basis. So you're doing a lot right, and, 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 um, and that must be the result of team, of governance. You know, what, what have you learned in your time in Alaska that you could share with this audience in terms of the, the recipe for your success? Yeah, thank you for that, and I think we take our performance with a lot of humility. We're very lucky to partner with a lot of great private equity kind of managers like Constellation throughout the ecosystem, which have uh, impacted our performance very nicely for our ultimate kind of beneficiaries in the state of Alaska. So we're very humbled by that performance. Um, and again, it's all, all about the partnerships that we have. And we're very proud to support GPs like Pollen Street and Astra via Constellation, which has performed well for us as well. Um, you know, uh, one of the key things, uh, you know, there's two key things uh, that's driving performance and I think governance that relates to some of our decision making as well. Uh, I think first performance is obviously driven by manager or deal selection. And the governance aspect is closely linked to having great leadership at the board and internal leadership levels. Uh, whether it's at the CEO level, CIO level, or alts head kind of levels, and all groups you've had great exposure to, kind of Daniel and team at, at Constellation, the investment flexibility that's set within the organization, the efficient decision-making processes to pursue opportunities like Constellation and many other creative opportunities that we've pursued that have impacted positively our performance. So I think good Good performance and good governance are very much aligned. Seems very basic, but sometimes very hard to put together. And I think APFC has has worked hard over the years to put those two key ingredients together, which have uh, which have turned out quite well so far for our stakeholders. And I just joined. Uh, full disclosure: I just joined APFC in March, 
So I've seen this firsthand working with Daniel on the team at Constellation in terms of the innovation partnership that we have, um, you know, with Constellation and other partners within the Constellation family. And Daniel, you've also been very critical in forming Constellation with our CEO and other leaders at APFC. Do you want to maybe share some insights from that experience as well? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes back. Uh, there's there's always um, those foundational moments in any partnership. I you know remember as Mark was talking about the, the first conversations that um, that we had with with Astra around some deal opportunities, and then that evolves into uh, you know a, a mutual respect, and then that evolves into a business partnership, and then that evolves into a flourishing set of businesses. Um, similar pattern with with uh, Alaska. Um, I was at the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds back in 2016 and met um, your boss, Angela Rodell, um, who, and I asked her, what's your strategic plan for the permanent fund? And she said, well, we want to go deeper into private markets. We want to find ways of partnering with other institutions globally. Um, uh, we'd like to develop a, a co-invest program. Um, uh, and in many ways, what she said back in 2016 is what a lot of people are kind of catching up to now. Um, and she had the foresight to, to put the Constellation idea together to connect me with Steve Mosley, who you mentioned. And then from there, um, the rest is, 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 is history. Um, you know, th that brings me to a, an interesting question I wanted to maybe refer back to, to Lindsay uh, around strategic partnerships. Um, you know, we've, we've uh, of course, we've really enjoyed working with your team um, uh, uh, across a number of dimensions from ESG to capital formation to uh, looking at, at uh, underwriting warehouse co-investment opportunities. What are the kinds of things, Lindsay, as you think about strategic partnership, whether that's with Constellation or maybe more importantly for this discussion with other um, investors around the world? How, how do you try to bring the whole firm, the whole of Pollen Street to them across the capital stack, across all the research and ideas that you guys generate. Yeah, so um, again, because we're focused in one particular sector, what we find is that while there is, um, you know, we, we're looking across six subsectors there, there's a very um, kind of strong thematic of, of, of need for each of the companies that are in our portfolio and across each of those subsectors. So if you think of the sector we're operating in, everybody wants to be good at, um, you know, digital marketing and, and kind of how you kind of engage customers in the modern world. Everybody's doing AML and onboarding. Everybody's doing cloud implementation. Everybody's doing the, how to consider using data to make their business a better business. So those kind of core needs are things that we then, what we did was we created something over the last several years called the hub, where we have those center of excellence within our um, within um, our team. So we have someone who spends their life in fintech and looking at the innovation and what's driving that, and not just the you know the superficial, but real re-engineering using um, digital across the entire um, product suite from um, um, to end to end to customer. We also have someone who is a kind of digital specialist in terms of IT scalability because we're taking mid-market businesses and we're growing them. So we bring that center of excellence. We have someone who thinks about selling kind of B2B business development and helps bring best practice. We've run our ESG program through that so that we get real engagement and real impact. So we go into the companies and we say, what does good look like for you and help them tailor their program. So standardize the reporting, but it's been great to actually kind of stoke energy and champions on ESG throughout the, the um, throughout the, 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 the organization and they feel they've got a stakeholder who's more interested. So we've used this hub and interestingly, what's happened is we've been engaging with some of the LPs more laterally is they want to get access. So we'll hold forums that are about each of these topics. We'll hold them used to be physically, now virtually, now a bit of hybrid, but actually bringing the groups of CTOs. And we've had, you know, North American LPs say to us, can you have a conversation with one of our portfolio companies in North America to explain to them how you're actually bringing this transformation? So we, they're asking to come to the sessions themselves. So there's a knowledge 
um, as, as and as the whole ecosystem evolves, if they've got a direct portfolio and they're doing co-invest, they want to actually have these skills for themselves. So there's a we are trying to bring a sort of domain expertise, but there's a knowledge sharing. There's a way of kind of creating a community and an ecosystem. And what we've tried to do with that ecosystem is make it a sort of safe place to ask all the dumb questions that you might feel as an LP you can't ask or as a, anybody you can't ask. So it's a safe place where you can, and we used it to massive effect through COVID where no one knew what government support schemes, no one. So rather than learn everything kind of 10 times, we kind of learned it, we shared it, and then we came to a community. So we've used that community and it started off for portfolio companies, but it's actually widening out into the LP community as they want to kind of build that knowledge for themselves and use it for their portfolio. So there's been lots that we've done to actually kind of make it a, an engaged and two-way relationship rather you know we always talk about we're we're um sort of more than capital to our portfolio companies now can we be more than capital to our LPs as well I, I love that and it, it it has so much in parallel to what we've been striving to build at the constellation level in terms of a hub right so yeah so just as and, and Mark I'm gonna tee up a question to you if you don't mind about sure. the experience we had with cyber and and bringing some uh, uh, experts from uh, both your portfolio company levels and your team, and also with Motive Partners, another of, of Constellation's proud uh, strategic partnerships, um, to share insights on cyber with asset owner partners and asset manager partners. This, this possibility for what I would call a virtual conglomerate, right? We've got, uh, Mark, you were saying that back in 2014, everyone was wondering, how can you work with a partnership that's geographically disparate. I'm sure you're not getting that question anymore. No uh, way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, now the question is, how do we make the most of a partnership regardless of where people are in the world and as well. inclusively as we can and do that at multiple levels, at the portfolio company level, as Lindsay was describing, at the level of the asset manager, and then at the level of asset owners with trillions of dollars looking to find the best homes. So, uh, you know, I'd love to hear, like, for example, with respect to cyber, it's also very exciting how you do it, Mark, because it's almost always in the context of specific co-investments, which I know sure. has been a core part of your uh, business model. So how do you think about the same types of issues? Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think what Lindsay described was, 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 was excellent. I, that, that model of creating a, uh, a hub of sorts in which there, I, we call it a Montessori school for those interested in communications and technology investing, right? So what we offer many of our deals and our cyber investment, a business called Searchlight, which is actually not even a London based, but a Southampton based provider of, of dark web analytics that we think is one of the leading product companies in the world. My partner, uh, Todd Crick, uh, got to know them at Black Hat two or three years ago, we invited them into our offices in DC and they said, hey, we've got a great product that's serving the federal space in the UK, but we really want to spread it across the five eyes globally. We really need to learn how to get into Washington and the wealth of information and access we have here in DC, whether it's our advisor, which Wilhelm from, from Booz Allen or uh, Bill Kennard's relationships from, from his times in, in, in government, we were able to mobilize a crack team to sort of help them take their technology and proliferate it in the US market in markets around the world and also now into the into the uh, commercial sector. And it's a small version of what we try to do in every deal that we do. And it, it begins though with, I would say, smart people looking at a trend that we're all passionate about in this communications and technology sector and then sort of figuring out where a deal comes from there. And it's the same with our LPs, uh, whether it's you and your colleagues or Shirag, uh, others within Constellation, you know, just in the past week, I've been on Zoom calls with members of the Wafer team, the uh, Alaska team, the Railpen team, all on different topics, one, ranging from, from fiber in Texas to in-building wireless and across the United States and globally. And, and that is where true partnership comes from. And what I'd also say is while I'm, I'm a huge advocate for technology, at the end of the day, it's the personal relationships that are fostered between the, the institutions that really create innovation. I, I mean, if, if anything, the, the innovation budget that you talk about, Daniel, to me is an opportunity for us to invite in 
new parties who want to get to know us well, who don't don't want to simply transact alongside us as we transact. And we, you know, we, we have our fund and we have our co-investment product. But the, the main reason we have been able to offer, in many cases, two, three X the amount of co-investment to our investment partners as their fund commitment levels is because there's a deep understanding of, of how we're going to attack the marketplace and an ability to work together in concert very quickly in order to compete and get deals done. You don't do uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of co-investments with other parties without really being able to, as I would say, no look past or finish one another's sentences pretty well. And, and, and that's what we're, we're, we're still looking to grow within the, um, the Astra family. And it started with one deal with Wafra that's now turned into a constellation relationship with 14 other great firms like Lindsay's and, you know, several, you know, great leading asset managers. And, and for us, it's just a continued journey towards, you know, fostering new relationships that we can use to manifest our own investing ideas collectively as we see opportunities in the marketplace. But the marketplace hasn't gotten any less competitive. If anything, it's moving faster than it has before. So the need for this structural innovation is as, 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 um, as great as it's ever been because, you know, we, our plan and the reason we leverage co-investment is what we don't want to be is a firm that changes its investment style as we're able to, to potentially raise more capital. So we always pursue deals in the sort of 50 to $150 million equity check size and just kind of marry up the fund and the co-investment as deals emerge. And for, for me, having close relationships with those who I can pick up the phone and say, you know, we've just seen a great opportunity. It's probably eight weeks from now that we're going to need to be, you know, putting in bid letters. You just, you can't be at the sort of nice to meet you. Let me, let me send you our, our, our materials phase and still get a deal done with that party. So what, what we like is the idea of building strategic partnerships that, that know us well, that allow us to meet on a regular basis, know the trends we're looking for. And, and those who aren't surprised, when we say, you know what, we've, we've found a deal. Most of the deals we've done and all of the spaces we're excited about have been the byproduct of very purposeful efforts, often more than 12 months long, to identify the right business, the right manager, and the right opportunity in a given space. We, we set out in the beginning of the, the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, to identify and building wireless opportunities that resulted in a deal at the end of 2019 and resulted in a great co-investment with, with, with RailPen, for example. Same thing happened in micro data centers, but most of our deals don't happen by accident. So we want partners who can be with us during that incubation phase of the idea and prepared to, uh, to jump on opportunities as they emerge. And, and that's, that's really what's most important to us. That's, that's the lifeblood of the firm, second only to to frankly just collaborating on ideas and to some degree, you know, geeking out on communications um, uh, evolution and, and, and where it might go as we did in that, that cyber panel, which was a lot of fun with you guys. Yeah, and just as a quick aside, Mark, if you ever start an actual Montessori school, I think you'd do such a fantastic <laughs> job. I would move uh, to DC with my three kids because that's hard to do virtually. Um, uh, but on the co-investment topic, um, you know, I wanted to, to uh, lob a question to, to Shirag on this, because as I mentioned at the top, you guys have been so innovative on this, 45 different positions across uh, directs and co-invests, um, such outstanding performance. Um, one of the things that you and I have spoken a lot about is, is how you develop that capability and also how groups like Constellation with Balance Sheet can potentially help, right? Because as Mark said, there's, there's the pace of a deal and then there's pace of diligence. And those things aren't always married. So if we can use balance sheet to warehouse a co-investment at cost and give asset owners enough time to diligence it, and also, by the way, certainty because the deal's actually been closed by the time you look at it, what an advantage that can be in, in your process. So I'd love to hear, and I know the audience would love to hear kind of how Alaska has pioneered in co-invest. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And I also want to quickly add on what Lindsay said about the hub. I think that's fantastic from a technology standpoint. The focus on digital and innovation internally, I think more GPs could probably do that and take advantage of the big data opportunity that's sitting within these GP uh, organizations. 
you know, like Pollen Street and Astra, obviously, you know, Mark, you and your team are very focused on that TMT space. Um, and I think also to what Mark said about communication, this kind of ties into co-investments as well. Uh, clearly, the COVID era has uh, resulted in greater communication between GPs and LPs and more frequent communication uh, and probably even closer ties um, around things like co-investments, Mark, that you mentioned as well with one of your deals. And I think because of that more frequent and greater communication, um, you know, we're seeing closer ties with our GPs as well. And there's a proactive effort by GPs to stay in touch with their LPs, but there's also a proactive effort that's required by LPs like APFC with GPs like Paul and Shree and Astra to stay in front of, of these GPs because LPs, uh, most of them want co-invest flow to drive their returns to balance uh, other considerations they might have internally as well. So co-invest flow is a key part of what most LP organizations are looking for, seeking to add, and we're no different from that perspective. And I think We've been fortunate um, also historically, I think we've been uh, working with some great partners globally. That's, that's been a huge boost to our co-invest flow. The other part of this as well, given the substantial flow that we're seeing in the fundraising market from GPs, obviously in this environment today, uh, we're seeing a significant uh, flow on the co-invest side as well. And a key part that I think Mark and Lindsay would also attest to this is investors like APFC giving quick no's uh, to GPs. So if something's not a fit, uh, my, my suggestion, not to give advice to others, but just to not hang around the hoop for too long, uh, you know, to give people like Mark and Lindsay some quick feedback, if something's not going to work out um, quickly, whether it's a timing issue, whether it's a portfolio construction fit, whatever it is, uh, to give a, a, a pretty quick reply, to be able to see that next deal, to be a good partner to them. Uh, they're going to continue to show deals in the spirit of being a good partner, uh, but I think it's incumbent upon both sides of the equation, uh, you know, to kind of give, uh, you know, quick answers and clear communication, uh, whether there's something that you want to move forward with or whether something that's not going to be a fit. So just wanted to start with that, because I think that's an important part of kind of building great partnerships and seeing good co-invest flow. That's great. And, and unfortunately, to, to uh, riff on, on Mark's bounce pass analogy, we're running out of clock here. At the, end, <laughs> at the end of our hour, but it's been a great pleasure to, uh, to play ball with you guys. And, and I've really enjoyed it. I think we've, we've hit on the themes that we talked about at the top, right? The, the innovation budget that we all have and how we're spending it to help our stakeholders, um, touching on structure, uh, on the different markets we're pursuing on, on team and how that's evolving in the, the new era. And then lastly, of course, technology. Um, with some cross-cutting points around co-investment that I think are on everybody's minds. Um, so I just want to take this last minute to thank um, all three of you, uh, Lindsay, Mark, Shirag, for taking the time. And, uh, and, and then, of course, to thank uh, the FT and, and the Greenwich Economic Forum. Um, uh, in my family, we, we often say, uh, you know, um, in the spring, next year in Jerusalem. So I think next year in Greenwich, right? <laughs> let's, let's hope that we get there. Um, and uh, we can do this in person because uh, that would be lovely. Um, but thank you. Thank, thank you for you inviting us. For, for, for joining. Thank you all. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Take care.